start streaming here now. Okay, shh, be quiet now. One. So hi everybody, good to have you. So we are live for the first time on three different channels, which is amazing. So we are on YouTube, we are on Periscope, and we're on Facebook. And today we have a good reason to celebrate because we've got Kevin Eby, who's done the most amazing footage and wildlife mm -hmm. photography. And he also is, um, he has just released a book and we have the pleasure of interviewing him live, which is really amazing. So hold your breath and just look at this amazing sequence, which you've never seen before. I haven't. So um, I'm going to give you three minutes just to enjoy this or two and a half minutes and then we'll go live. I'm going to mute my microphone now. Thank you. Hello everyone, we're back again. It's a Friday show. It's going to be a really exciting show today. I'm so excited to welcome a very brilliant wildlife photographer to you. But just before we do it, I just want to say we're live at the moment on Facebook and on YouTube. Periscope seems to have a little bit of issues, which I'll probably fix next time. But I can see there are quite a few on uh, live on Facebook, which is great. And I can see all my friends here. Uh, on YouTube. So thank you for joining. And um, it's getting cool, at least here in, in British Columbia. And I'm sure in, you know, in the uh, West Coast, at least down to Northern California, it would be getting a lot cooler too. Uh, I don't know how it is for you on the East Coast. But anyway, it's um, exciting because slowly the eagles are coming back. We know that in October, November, it gets really exciting. And then all the salmon runs come and so on. It's a really wonderful time. So that's exactly what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about eagles, wildlife, passion about wildlife and capturing it in a very unique way. And this is all about Kevin Eby. I'm very delighted to to bring him on board. I've been trying this for months together with Nicole and he has been so busy with the incredible sequence that you have uh, been able to watch behind me and that's what it's really about. This is an amazing sequence. So 
I'm going to bring Kevin in now. Let's just hope he's going to be there. Let's make myself disappear here. Let's just see if I can manage that. Oh, now I'm a double again. I usually manage that. <laughs> okay, here we go. This should be it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'm going to disappear for a moment and I'm going to welcome Kevin. Kevin, it's so wonderful to have you here on the show. How are you doing? Doing great and thank you so very much for having me. <laughs> Kevin, you are a most amazing wildlife photographer. There's no doubt you've become very famous with this incredible sequence there. Tell us a little bit about where you are uh, located, how you come about to be so passionate about wildlife and um, also about capturing nature, in fact, and you bring out a new book. Let's hear something about your background and later we'll get lots of viewers to come in with their questions. So go ahead, please, Kevin. Yeah, so I was uh, born and raised near Seattle. I, I grew up in a town called Puyallup, um, which is about an hour south of Seattle. Right now, I, I live in Linwood, which is about a half hour north of Seattle. Um, and just my fondest memories growing up were being with my parents and going to national parks. Um, you know, we didn't do a lot of big vacations, but we did do a lot of weekend trips to Mount Rainier or Olympic National Park. And um, as I grew up, um, I, I, you know, that, that passion for nature was just instilled in me. And I, I started actually as a, as a print journalist. I worked at uh, newspapers in the greater Seattle area, the News Tribune and Tacoma, the Seattle Times for a while. Um, but what I would like to do is still go hiking. And um, I wasn't at all interested in art or photography. I just wanted to go hiking. And... Um, it just got to a point where what I wanted to do was to show people pictures of the places that I'd been and, and some of the amazing things that I'd seen. And I just realized, you know, these photos that I'm taking are just are just so terrible. They don't capture any of the emotion or the impact or the the drama of what I had witnessed when I was there. It just um, it didn't feel like it, it really, truly um, captured the 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 magnitude of, of the wilderness. And so I gradually did a lot of studying to learn the language, the visual language of photography um, and did a lot of studying of uh, painters, um, just trying to learn what, what makes an image good. I mean, how does it like hit you in your heart? And um, over time, the pictures got dramatically better and that just became my passion. I just wanted to do it more and more and more. And uh, it eventually kind of turned into a business. Um, one of the things that I had found was that there were a lot of wildlife photographers who were working who would take a very close-up picture of a deer's head, and um, but wouldn't really tell the story of that deer. It was just it's it's a very tiny, um, you know, one one little picture of a deer, and but no no context of that animal. And, how it survives and where it lives and what it does from day to day. And um, some editors had actually found my website. And this was a website that I had just created to share pictures with friends. And they had found that there were some images on this website that I had put together for friends that they thought just did a great job in telling the story uh, that they wanted to tell in the magazine. And so I started um, licensing images to magazines that way and just realized that there actually was a real need to create um, images that actually help tell the story of the wilderness. And that is something that I'm incredibly passionate about and have now devoted my life to doing. Well, Kevin, that's very well explained. What what interests me is uh, uh, two things. Well, the way uh, you described it, uh, you're obviously very systematic. When you said, you know, you 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 studied art books and so on, so you had a very it seems a very systematic approach. You know that you you exactly how to do it. What what interests me is, I mean, you live in Seattle, which is similar to Vancouver. There are lots of people here. It's not exactly a wildlife center. So where do you go? <laughs> where do you capture all your wildlife? <laughs> Surprisingly, actually, there is a lot of wildlife around here. One of uh, the places where I had gotten some of my first images that really got licensed were in the Seattle Arboretum, um, an area that is set aside near the University of Washington to preserve a variety of different types of trees. And um, there is a waterway that cuts through part of it. And one of the things that I loved to do in the summer was just get in a kayak and paddle around in the wetlands. And 
when you're at a kayak, you can get 10 feet away from a great blue heron that's fishing, and it knows that you're no threat because it, it knows just how unskilled you are on the water. And, and uh, so you could just witness these incredibly amazing things. You know, you, you now uh, sort of become part of the, the, the environment that, you know, where the wildlife dominate. Um, and you're a guest in this as opposed to, you know, seeing them someplace where, um, you know, it's not as wild. And it was just uh, being able to watch a heron hunt um, was just fascinating to me. And, you know, that's an opportunity that's actually within the Seattle city limits. And there are also a lot of areas that are, you know, a half hour from Seattle. If you head up into the, the, uh, um, Cascade Mountains. Um, and in, during the winter, there's a lot of great wildlife a couple of hours north of Seattle in the Skagit Valley. Um, so there's those opportunities. And uh, one of the other projects that I did just a couple of weeks, a uh, couple of uh, years ago, actually, was documenting crows. Um, two freeway exits from my house, there is a roost where 16,000 crows come to roost um, every single night during the fall and winter and into the spring. And just seeing, I mean, I realize that, you know, a lot of people may find crows boring, but anytime you have 16,000 of one animal uh, migrating together at night and coming into a roost um, in the span of 10 or 15 minutes, that is just such a dramatic nature show. And was I was able to create great art in that. That was a, a fun six month art project for me that um, ended up going into a gallery in Portland, Oregon. Um, so it's just, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities around you and you think you may be in a big city, but um, you know, there's a lot of wildlife all around us. You just have to kind of look for it sometimes. Well, Kevin, you're a very passionate person. I think that's clear to everyone. I can see that on the comments. I see Lady Hawk, Osprey Mama, and all the people, you know, who come in, uh, all the proud, proud cat mama of two, and I'm sure they're going to bombard you with a lot of questions in a moment. But before we do that, you know what? I'm actually going to show your videos, I think, much better when the questions come in. So uh, so, so we get uh, a, a taste of what you all do. Of course, I mean, I'm uh, being a photographer myself. I'm just curious, you know, wh what, uh, wh you know, what type of equipment do you actually use now? So I've been using Canon equipment for my entire time of doing this professionally. I, I have two cameras. Um, I switch between landscape and wildlife. Um, I like to work on one wildlife project, and then after that's done, switch to a landscape project and kind of go back and forth. I just find that if I don't do that, I, it's really easy for me to sort of get stuck in a rut creatively. And so I find that just mentally switching gears like that helps me do more creative landscape and wildlife work. So for the landscape photography, I have a, I, my current camera is a Canon 5DS. Um, and I have a huge bag of lenses that is way too heavy on my back as I'm going through airports. But um, the, the wildlife camera is the, the Canon 1DX Mark II. And for a lot of the, the wildlife, well, for the uh, bald eagle, fox, and rabbit sequence, that was shot with uh, the first generation of that 600 millimeter lens and a, and a teleconverter. And that was it as far as that equipment went. Okay, so you have top equipment. I mean, I, I, can, I can certainly appreciate that. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, but, I mean, let's go to this incredible sequence of, of the, uh, you know, of the eagle and the fox. I might just be able to bring it back in the background but you know as um let's just see if i can uh, yeah let me just take the one picture at least uh so people seeing the sequence now let me see if i can get it back in for us there we go there we go so tell us a little bit about this i mean this is uh, is this near seattle or wh where where was this and what were you doing there i mean obviously you weren't expecting this so tell us a bit about this yeah, so this happened on San Juan Island, which is, um, uh, there's a, a chain of islands that's in uh, northwest Washington, in between the state of Washington and Vancouver Island. Um, uh, just, you know, gorgeous remote islands. And on San Juan Island is a park called the San Juan Island National Historical Park. And this is a park that isn't really known for nature. It was actually known more for um, um uh, the uh, the General Robert the, the Robert's Rules of Order. Um, it's really devoted to the history around sort of the Bay of Pigs and and uh, and the military fortification um, during that period of time. You know, as people were getting ready for this battle that never happened. Um, 
But in this park, there actually is um, some nature. There were rabbits that were introduced to the island in the late 1800s, um, introduced by early settlers who wanted something to hunt. And those rabbits had no problem whatsoever taking off. There is an abundance of, of Eurasian, um, European rabbits to this day. So about 10 to 15 years later, they introduced red foxes to the island, hoping to kind of keep the rabbit population in check. And what actually ended up happening was the foxes actually liked the voles that were in the park even more than the rabbits. So this park actually has a pretty good population of rabbits and foxes to this day, you know, 100 years after they were introduced. Um, so it's pretty well known among the, the nature photography community that there are a lot of fox kits that you can photograph on this island pretty easily um, during the month of May. And that's why I was there. It was just, it was a, a great time to get a wide variety of really young, cute, um, red foxes, um, you know, prancing around the prairie and, um, you know, getting their first taste of trying to hunt and, and that. And so the, my, my time on the island was entirely to just get cute pictures of foxes. And um, late in the day, uh, the foxes had switched from playing to actually starting to hunt the rabbits. And so the, the fox that's in this uh, sequence had caught a rabbit and all of the other fox kits wanted his rabbit. And so he was running across the prairie with it. And behind me, I heard the cry of a bald eagle. And so I turned around and I saw the eagle way off in the distance, but it was heading our direction. And I was just positive at this point that I knew what was going to happen. I Because I had done um, a book on bald eagles and I knew that one of the things that they like to do well frankly they're they're lazy if it's easier for them to steal food than it is to hunt it they will steal from any you know anybody i mean they are all about expending the least possible effort to get the greatest meal and so i thought well of course you know it saw this really inexperienced fox with a rabbit that's almost as big as it is i mean i i thought what i was going to get was one picture of the eagle scaring the fox the fox dropping the rabbit and the eagle kind of running off with it and while the camera you know can shoot 14 frames a second i thought i i was going to be really lucky to get one picture of the action and so i had trained i was following the fox across the prairie just knowing that you know it was going to be the target of this action getting ready for my one picture and um the eagle flies right in and it there is a you know a little bit of action and so i'm i click the the shutter and you know my camera is a, a single lens reflex camera it's not one of those with an electric viewfinder so whenever it takes a picture the viewfinder blacks out um during the as it's it's taking the picture because the mirror has to go out to let the light hit the sensor and when the the viewfinder comes back i see that the action is still going on that this wasn't one picture this was actually more of a struggle and i see all three of them suddenly lift into the air and what's going through my mind as this happening is, first of all, this is incredibly unique and I've got to capture it. But I'm also thinking this action is just playing out erratically all over the sky. I can't screw this up. I mean, I've been photographing for 20 years now. I've never seen anything like this. I don't think I will ever see anything like this again. I've got to get one picture out of this incident that just shows how crazy this is. And so over the entire time that I was photographing this, I was just struggling to track the action as best as I could um, with the camera and the lens. And just keep in mind, this was a 600 millimeter lens with a teleconverter on it. So it's, you know, um, 800 some millimeters of magnification. And so it's almost like tracking this a bit through a telescope, you know, because in order for me to be able to use these images, I can't crop way into the image. I need to, to get, uh, you know, make, the subjects that I'm photographing as big in the viewfinder as possible. So there's not a lot of room for error. And so it's like trying to track this crazy action, this erratic action um, with a telescope um, mounted to, you know, a tripod that's pivoting. And um, and this ends up playing out over eight seconds. This battle lasts eight seconds before the bald eagles finally able to separate the fox from the rabbit and drop the fox and fly off. 
And so as soon as the fox dropped uh, you know, to the ground, I, I wanted to make sure that it was okay. Um, it ran over to a um, um, sort of a burrow uh, that was near me. And so I was able to kind of look at it. It was kind of shaking the thing off a little bit. And I took some close-up pictures of it just to try to see if I could see any obvious injuries that I would want to alert somebody to. And then I was almost afraid to even play back the image sequence on my camera because um, one of one of the things that was going through my head as this was happening was that the camera was not set up for this kind of action. Um, what I was photographing just before this had happened was the fox running across the prairie with the rabbit. And to do that, what I wanted was a long shutter speed. What I wanted was to pan with the fox to get some movement. I wanted the, the red flowers and some of the prairie grass to kind of blur. And so here you're photographing something where there's a lot of erratic action and things are happening very quickly. And I'm using a shutter speed that's about four times slower than I would have chosen if I had more time to prepare. And so I was just worried that nature had handed me, you know, given me like this huge gimme and that I was going to come away with absolutely nothing from this. And so I was really just petrified to even look at the memory card. Um, and so I, I finally got the... Uh, um, got the courage to hit the play button on the camera and kind of look and I had identified a couple of images that I thought would work, uh, but I did not bring a laptop or anything with me up to the island. It was just, you know, I wasn't planning on doing that much photography or doing anything where you would have to react to it that quickly. And so it wasn't until I got back to my home studio that I realized that actually I had most of the sequence and probably 80% of the images were really sharp. So I, I'm so thankful, but I, I did not have a lot of confidence as that was going down. Well, well, Kevin, I can completely understand you. I mean, uh, uh, I, I can imagine what, uh, because I've been in such a situation myself, of course, and I think a lot of wildlife photographers have done that. When something really unique happens, it's your chance of your life. And you think, for goodness sakes, my shutter speed is wrong, and maybe the focus is not on spot and whatever. <laughs> so I, I completely, I completely get it. So uh, you know, I, but I mean, it's no, it's not just luck that, that you got this. It's, 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 you know, you, 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 you obviously stayed calm enough in this moment to do what you had to do. And uh, you know, I really congratulate you, and I absolutely admire the outcome. It's. Uh, it's it's marvelous and it tells a beautiful story. You know, I'm just when I look at the image, you can see there's some the fox there's some spray or so on its back coming out. What's that yeah. about? Yeah, I think the fox the eagle scared the scared the the urine out of the fox because you actually see that in a lot of the early images in the sequence. Um, and you know, it, it just I you know I I love still photography for this reason because this thing was this whole incident was over in eight seconds um, and just think about you know how fast eight seconds goes by um, but with the power of still photography you could take each one of these you know 250 seconds of a, a second slices of time and um, I think just really get a an incredible sense of just the drama that was going on at that time it's just um I, there was another photographer who had actually shot video of the sequence and it just goes by so fast that, um, you know, I, I appreciate it because it just really shows you how fast it, you know, this was over. But it's just for me, I, I want to capture the still images of it because I think these these little slices of time just really help you just kind of understand how epic this battle really was um, and how it just captures the drama more. Yeah, you know, Kevin, I absolutely agree with you because the the, the thing with with video is exactly you you're shooting at thirty uh, frames or or maybe you're shooting at sixty frames a second, and it's very difficult to slow it down without getting blurred. I mean, the clarity of your images are are are, are mind blowing, and this is what what's so amazing about photography, isn't uh, for photography, isn't it? That we can actually do something like that. Um, so. Uh, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit more of what what happened then. You know, okay, now you are you, your your heart attacks over. You thought, my goodness, I've really done it. And then yeah. then what did you do? I mean, did you show it to your friends? And how did it suddenly come so virally popular? 
Yeah, how it became so virally popular, I don't think I will ever know. I, I have some theories about elements of the story, which I'll get to in a moment. But um, one of the things that I try to do, I really love to share the stories of the photography. I think a lot of times, you know, especially in this era when, you know, everybody's taking pictures of their food and everybody can take pictures, you know, with their smartphones that I think to a certain extent, um, photography isn't quite seen as much as art as it may have been 10 or 20 years ago. And so one of the things that I really do try to do is to, um, as much as I can, tell the story behind the images, tell the story about how I decided to do the settings the way that I did, how, why I tried to frame it the way that I did to show that there really is a thought process. This wasn't just me setting up, you know, in some field somewhere and taking some random snapshots. Um, and so when I had the, when I knew that I had about nine or 10 images of this epic battle, um, I thought, well, this is just a natural blog post to kind of show what I go through as a wildlife photographer. Obviously, you don't get this kind of drama all the time, but this is a great example of how you have to be prepared for anything. You know, I was prepared to photograph cute little foxes poking their heads out of the burrows, and instead nature handed me this eight second battle between a bald eagle and a fox that I, you know, I, I've never seen any other example of this and I don't think I will ever get to see it again. Um, so I wrote a story on my blog with um, about nine or 10 of the images and, and posted this about, you know, this epic thing that I had witnessed on San Juan Island and um, posted it to my social media and almost immediately the, the, the Facebook, um, notification thing is just dinging like a jackpot machine in Las Vegas. And I had never, you know, I've had two postage stamps and, you know, the feedback from those, um, yeah, I thought, I thought, you know, the postage stamps was going viral. Um, you know, cause that triggered some news stories and interviews and stuff, but it was just as my Facebook is dinging like a slot machine, I realized, wow, I have, I have not experienced this before. And then all of a sudden it was TV stations that were sending emails. Um, and, you know, my work, I, I license it. So I, lic I do a lot of work licensing images to newspapers and magazines and books. I mean, that's just the nature of my business. And just all of a sudden then I was hearing from newspapers all over the world. Um, and there was a time probably when I was getting um, 20 or 30 emails an hour uh, very shortly after the the blog came and these were all people who wanted to license the image and needed high resolution files and um, wanted more information on the story. And then it just kept growing and growing and growing. These newspapers just kept getting farther and farther away. Um, there was a newspaper in Russia that actually ended up licensing the images. Um, the whole sequence appeared in every daily newspaper in Australia, all of the London daily newspapers. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I couldn't even tell you how many places the, the thing had run. And, and it just kept going and going and going. Um, you know, the um, my I posted one of the images and a link to the blog on Instagram. And that had had 100,000, um, you know, impressions in no time at all. Um, and it was just like it really changed for me what a viral photo was. I, I thought that I was equipped to deal with that and I could... I could just not have been more surprised. Um, and just dealing with all the publications that wanted to use those images, that became my full-time job for a couple of weeks, even as I was trying to get the latest edition of my book out. It was just like, I have other work to do, but I mean, this, this just um, was all encompassing. I was, um, there were interview requests, you know, at five o'clock in the morning that I was getting up to do. And, um, you know, wasn't done, you know, filling invoices and, and providing high resolution files, you know, until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. It was just a, a huge whirlwind for a couple of weeks. And I think, you know, what really made the story click, if anything, is just the fact that there is, um, you know, the fox is okay. Um, the, uh, I, I just... I think the fact that there is a cute little picture at the end of this thing with the fox looking a little sheepish out of its den um, allows us to really appreciate the spectacle for what it is. Um, 
and I just I think if the fox was more gravely injured, um, I just I think this would be one of those nature horrifying experiences that a lot of people would be afraid to like. Uh, I I just I think we can kind of appreciate it um, for the um, just amazing um, sequence that this is because. Um, at least for the fox, it had an okay, happy ending. And people did check on that fox for a couple of weeks, even, and it was fine. So, Very nice, Kevin. Well, I'm, I'm really happy for you. It went to Australia, to Russia, and so many other places. I'm actually not surprised about Russia because... Uh, you know they they have introduced foxes and, and uh, in, on many islands, as you probably know. You know it's a yeah. it's it's a, it's quite it's quite a history, and there are quite a, a number of quite talented uh, Russian photographers, wildlife photographers, who you may know too. So so this story that it comes to Russia doesn't surprise me. Australia, of course, because I mean they're so incredibly involved with wildlife, and so on. The UK, of course. Uh, also, also no surprise. I'm going to start with some questions now. So I'm just going to tell my team, so Nicole and so on, pl please post the questions here. I can see them coming in now. So let me, yes, let me just, Kevin, one second. So the let's go to question number one from Holly. I never can't pronounce this correctly. Ginnan, yes. Do you need a 50-pound camera lenses? Do you need 50-pound camera lenses to capture such shots? Go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> um. So the lens is actually 13 pounds, um, and there is a brand new version of it that I would love to have that's only six pounds, but it's way out of my budget. Um, the, the answer is um, it depends. It depends on what you want to photograph. Um, in this case, um, I absolutely needed that lens for this, this sequence because it played out 100 feet away from me. Um, and so if it was a, a shorter lens, the eagle and the fox would have been so much smaller in the, in the image. And I really would have had a crop into it that I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of, of um, it would have really limited what I could do with the images later on. Um, you know, the more you have to crop away, the less um, pixels you have left to make nice enlargements. And I've, uh, I've had people who've wanted, you know, giant 18 by you know, 28 inch um, enlargements of this photo. And it holds up really well just because I had a really good, sharp um, lens and really didn't have to crop the images all that much in order to be able to get that. Um, the thing, the other way I would answer your question, though, is that I think um, not having a 13 pound lens doesn't mean you can't go out and do wildlife photography. Um, you know, again, one of my favorite projects that I've done was photographing the crows that the 16,000 crows that come to roost in this, in these wetlands that aren't far from my house. And one of my most popular images from that whole project was shot with an 11 millimeter lens an 11 millimeter lens. Um, so you don't necessarily need a, a, you know, the big giant white lens in order to be able to do wildlife photography. Um, you know, it's, it's all about using what you have and finding something that you're passionate about. Good, Kevin. Thank you. That was very clear. So you see, it's not all about, uh, it's not about lens weight. <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's, uh, it's a good balance, but it's also a good balance of budget, like uh, Kevin explained very well. Question from Dana Steele. Very nice to have you, Dana. Did the fox live? I think he answered that. And who won the battle? I think maybe just explain a little bit more. Go ahead. Yeah, so the eagle got the rabbit, and the, the eagle carried the rabbit back to its nest. I, I think this eagle was nesting a, about a mile away. Um, the next day, I had done some scouting in the area, and I saw an active bald eagle um, nest. Um, it was about a mile away from where this took place. And just from the research that I had done into the book, I knew that bald eagles in this area need about a one mile hunting range. So I'm, you know, while I don't know for a fact that that was the eagle that was involved in this, I'm pretty sure it was just given the behavior that we know about nesting eagles. Uh, the fox was okay. People had checked on him even a couple of weeks later. Uh, one of the really interesting things actually, um, the thing that surprised me was that the bald eagle would even really a, a try to get it from a fox because there were plenty of rabbits in this field that, that the, uh, that the eagle could have gotten easily on its own. Um, but I would have thought um, that after this had happened, that the eagle would have 
learned a lesson from this and thought that this was probably really risky behavior that it didn't want to engage in um, in the future. You know, you think about it, you know, that fox was swinging around a lot um, and could very well have injured the eagle. And the eagle was not able to carry away both the fox and the rabbit, it just doesn't have that kind of strength. So I would have thought that you would never see the eagle try to steal from a fox again. And I'd heard from people who had said that the eagle was continuing to try to steal from foxes. But and this is why I love wildlife photography so much, that they had also noticed that the foxes now were actually working together to alert each other when the eagle was in the area. So it's just like the whole dynamics of this prairie had changed following this incident and I just uh, I just have a natural curiosity for that that kind of stuff and, and especially the you know the behavior and the impact to that and so it was um, very fascinating to me that you know the eagle would continue to try to steal from foxes but that the foxes had also learned something from this experience as well. Thank you. That's very clear. Now comes Osprey Mama from Florida. Hi Osprey Mama and thank you for your donation. Very kind. Did you get shots of the eagle actually eating the prey once it landed? Or did you just get the story there? That is the question. <laughs> yeah, I did not get to see the eagle eat its prey. I think um, it flew off and out of my range. That park is set up in a way where there's um, some hills. Uh, I hate to call them hills because they're not really all that tall. Um, but your view is kind of blocked um, where this action had happened it's it's kind of down in a in a bowl almost and there are some higher hills as you can kind of see a little bit from the video sequence that are kind of around your sides and so once the eagle was able to take off with the rabbit it ended up kind of going over one of those hills and out of my view right that's that's very clear next question hi proud cat mama of two kevin is the fox an adult or juvenile? Good question. Do you know? It is definitely a juvenile. And I know it's hard to tell from the picture, but it, it was probably uh, less than two months old. Um, it was one of this year's kits that were, were born. The adults are more than double that size. Right. Good question. Good. And now comes Holly Ginnon again. How high up in the ground did the fox lift? Uh, was the fox lifted? Sorry. <laughs> so initially, they got about twenty feet up into the air, and that. Um, but the eagle rapidly started sinking back down to the ground. Uh, a bald eagle can lift about four or five pounds pretty comfortably, and the fox by itself was probably easily over that weight, even though it was a very young fox. So the fact that they were able to get you know 20 feet up was i'm sure all inertia that eagle was flying really fast as it came in to try to snatch the prey um but yeah it got up about 20 feet and then rapidly started sinking back to earth by the time the eagle finally dropped the fox the fox only probably fell about the, maybe four feet good and now come some curious questions michael benson hi michael have you produced for national geographic kevin have you um, so this image actually became a National Geographic story for their website. I've had a number of images in their books, um, but unfortunately have not made it actually into the magazine. That's still a dream of mine. Um, there's been a number of their books um, where they've used my scenic images. Um, uh, one of my Grand Canyon images was used as a two-page spread in one of their big photography books. Um, a few years ago, and they've used a lot of my Iceland work and some of their other books, but unfortunately have not been in the magazine, but um, have worked with them a lot, especially with their books and their web website division. Yeah, but I think you're being rather modest because you have actually made it into National Geographic. I think that was the question. So I would say the answer is absolutely yes, Kevin, you have. So <laughs> you're you never at marketing. <laughs> you are, you are very, you're very modest. So really, uh, Michael, the answer is absolutely yes, he has made it. Next question, number seven from MacLady. Kevin, do you consider this one of your best sequence shots? I know that you have been thrilled. Is this your best sequence ever? I think it is probably my best sequence ever, um, and I don't know how to gauge if it's like my best photo ever. Uh, one of the things that I really struggle with is that the, my favorite shot is always the last one that I took, 
And then I, it's just, you can't calm, I just can't calm my brain down. And then just all of a sudden you find all these tiny little things that you wish you would have done different and, and all these little flaws in it. And um, so then I end up going through this process where I, I just only see the things that went wrong. And then eventually at some point in time, it kind of comes back into the fold. So um, whether it will go down as like one of my best w wildlife shots ever, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think a lot of, I think it will be the thing that I'm known for. Um, and I think it is by far the most dramatic sequence that I've ever shot of, of anything. But uh, um, there are other wildlife images that I've done that I, I like a lot and I think may actually even be more artistic. So I don't know, hard, hard for me to answer. Yeah, I could understand that. Okay, just uh, I'm going to just jump over two questions because they have been answered already from Sherry. Um, this may be a duplicate question. Where was it taken? How high did the eagle lift the fox? So we will skip that one, Sherry. Thank you very much. So it has been answered. Brenda or Randolph. Hi, Brenda. How, yeah, how much did that fox weigh? I think Kevin answered that. That's quite a lot more than uh, an eagle usually lifts. So, uh, so he couldn't lift it too long. Uh, next question, number 10 from Jackie Porter. Yes, that's a good question here. Is there anything that you have not photographed yet and that you would love to photograph? Here you go, Kevin, your chance. Oh, my goodness. That list is so long um, and that <laughs> list gets longer every day. In terms of wildlife, I mean, I would love to actually be on Antarctica and get the March of the Penguins. Um, there's a lot of wildlife in Africa that I would like to photograph, but I haven't had the chance to do that yet. In terms of landscape photography, um, I, like volcanic eruptions seem to elude me. I've actually photographed lava flowing into the ocean in Hawaii, and I've tried to uh, travel to active volcanoes several times. Um, uh, probably the biggest attempt that I had made was when the big volcano in Iceland was erupting. It's a country where I've spent um, a bit of time, and so I actually know the country relatively well. So when the volcano went off, I mean, I knew exactly how I was going to get there and how I was going to hike. As I was on the plane on my way to Iceland, the volcano stopped. So um, an active volcano still eludes me, and that's um, something that, that I'm just very fascinated by volcanoes. And would love to actually be there at a cone as it's uh, blasting into the air. Oh, Kevin, I can completely understand. I just had to think of my uh, sister. She just uh, sailed past Stromboli, you know, one of the famous active uh, volcanoes in, uh, you know, of, of Sicily. Really beautiful. And, and I completely agree. My dream, by the way, is Kamchatka, you know, that whole area yeah, yeah. Uh, with the stellar yeah. eagles. And, and, and it's just incredible. You know, you have wildlife, you have about everything you can dream of. So I just had to call, had to bring that in as, as a dream of mine. So That's on my list. That's probably... <laughs> in my top 10 <laughs> <laughs> oh, well maybe we'll take the same plane who knows we'll go there together because it's uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's amazing right okay car let's carry on Kathy Newton yeah how much did you think the co fox weighed so I think he's answered that but now comes the other question that you may have not answered and were you surprised the eagle could lift both the fox and rabbit at all I think that's a great question so what do you think <laughs> um I'm you know, I would not have guessed that that was going to happen, but as I think back on what happened, I totally understand how it did. I mean, a bald eagle can travel, you know, 60 miles an hour at a short distance as it's hunting prey, and that is a lot of momentum. Um, so it clearly had a lot of power going in as it was trying to steal that rabbit. And so the fact that it was able to lift all three of, uh, you know, the, the rabbit and the fox, you know, briefly, I totally can see how that happened, but you can also then see how, how rapidly it sank back to earth, you know, as, as just the power of that momentum rapidly faded and it was struggling to try to, to manage all that weight. Okay, very good, Kevin. What I'm going to see now is we're going to slowly move over to your other things because I, Kevin's got a lot more. This is not the only thing he's, he's done, so don't, don't get it wrong here <laughs> just because we're so excited about it. But uh, uh, that's exactly Terry Green is asking that. Beautiful scenic pic behind you. Uh, is that one of yours? Well, I'm sure it's not uh, somebody else's. I, I would say it's probably yes. And what is it? 
It is the uh, full moon rising over the Tatouche Range next to Mount Rainier. It was an image that I had gotten about, um, what was it, about uh, 2005, I believe. Um, one of the things that I love to do is um, whenever I photograph, I'll get out of the way. Whenever I, I love to photograph the moon um, and I love to have it as an element in uh, landscapes. Um, but it's always hard to find an element of a landscape that's majestic enough to where you can kind of pull the two together. And so I had studied topographical charts um, and weather conditions, and I had uh, identified one night that there would be a hike that I could do uh, in an area called High Rock that is just uh, southwest of Mount Rainier National Park, where I could climb up and get to the top of this ridge at sunset and get the moon um, rising with the mountain and was blessed to actually have some of those, um, some lenticular clouds begin to form as well. It's one of my favorite images of Mount Rainier that I've been able to take over the years. Uh, it's absolutely magnificent. I mean, you know, if we, if we could see it, uh, uh, you know, we can we can we can certainly see it. I I can so understand it from our place. We see beautiful Mount Baker, and I've always been looking for the perfect timing of the moon just rising and getting this angle exactly right. You know, so you just is on top of uh, Mount Baker. So I I understand exactly what, where you come from. It's such a beautiful, really beautiful shot of Mount Rainier. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> Okay, next question. Let's continue. Uh, so that was that one. Yes, Alatrack. Hi, Alatrack. Trace, uh, Tracy. Oh, is that right? Tracy, I'm not sure. Um, let me just see. Oh, yes. How long have you been a photographer? I hope you didn't say this already, but maybe you could just explain that again. <laughs> yeah, so I, really, I started licensing um, images and selling prints in 2001. So that, that really was kind of the beginning of, of doing this professionally. So it's 17 years. Right, 17 years. One second, I'm just going to try, Kevin, I just lost uh, Reconnect. One second, I'm just going to try and get, uh, I hope this is going to work because you've got so many beautiful videos here. Yeah, here we go. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about this scene here that I'm going to show now. Yeah, so this is on the Nooksack River in Washington State. So this is just, if you know the area well, it's... it's um, mainly east of Bellingham and especially during the month of December you can have uh, a thousand bald eagles come into this river and um, to feast on spawned out salmon um, one of the, the themes of my um, my eagle book was just that um, and also with the, the incident with the, the fox and the rabbit is that um, eagles would rather uh, don't want to expend a lot of effort in order to be able to get their meals. And so here you have this river where there are thousands and thousands of salmon that are swimming up this river to spawn and they die and then these carcasses just get trapped, trapped in, the, uh, in the gravel beds and eagles have figured this out and so you can actually have eagles travel from a, a thousand miles to actually come to this river to be able to feast and get all this, this easy meat during the, the month of December. Um, so what I did was I, I wanted to capture some video of the exchanges of bald eagles as they're um, fighting over salmon because there's actually been a lot of research into that. Um, one of the things, one of the, the best pieces of research uh, that has been done on um, fighting between bald eagles was actually done on the Mixac River in the 1980s. And one of the things that they found, and I, I completely appreciate this because my degree is actually in economics. Um, one of the things that this research had found was that eagles actually um, play out game theory in their heads before they engage in fights. Um, so you might think, you know, these eagles are just like such fierce, powerful birds that they must, must just have like these dramatic knockout, drag out wars between birds. Uh, but one of the things that this research had found is that most of the fights last only a few seconds. Um, and that's because the eagles... Um, size up their challengers before they engage in a fight. So if this is a young eagle, they're probably more likely to try to engage because they know it's really easy to overpower them. But if it's an eagle that's really hungry, that's another data point that might suggest that that eagle might put up a really good fight. And so both the eagle that's thinking about attacking and the eagle that's feeding both kind of do these mental calculations using a couple of data points in their heads to decide whether or not... Um, 
whether or not they're going to fight. And so I created this video to just show how brief these fights are. But I know, Christian, you've got to, I, and I wish I would have had the idea to do this. I love your slow motion video of one of those fights because that really just captures, um, you know, the drama of the fight, but also just how brief these things are because the Eagles don't want to fight a second longer than they have to. You know, it's interesting, Kevin, that you mentioned uh, game theory. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a physicist myself, so... <laughs> You know these these uh, that that means a lot to me. It's it's funny. You know, um, I was just thinking about that because I I have uh, probably similar to you. I've spent a lot of time when uh, you know at least on the illusions, studying eagles and their behavior and when they actually uh, move in. And you're absolutely right. The slow motion reveals much better how they're actually perceiving their environment when to engage. It can be an eagle that has lost a beak and is not able to tear food apart or so. It's so incredibly fascinating, uh, you know, how they watch when that eagle just has eaten enough because they gulf down the food at such a rate and they know when the crop is full and when it will not engage in a fight anymore. It's, 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 you're absolutely right. That's, it's so fascinating to watch that and the whole hierarchy and eventually everybody gets their food it's just <laughs> it's game theory <laughs> it's a it's a strategic chess game yes <laughs> very, very well love, well said about photography it's just mm. so fascinating the more that you do this and the more that you take time to actually study your subject you just, you realize just how incredible the world is and um, you know, I just I can't imagine I'm ever going to get bored doing this because there are just so many stories that are still needing to be told. Absolutely. Let's get to the next question. OK, let me just see a uh, question from Sherry. Yeah, the eagle is. Uh, uh, let me see. Oh, yeah. The accuracy of the eagle is amazing. Yes. How much. Uh, uh, oh, oh, this is a difficult one. Well, uh, you, how much force, or we should say, how much pressure is there actually in the eagle's grip? I think this is a, you know, by the way, we've had this. I, sorry, Kevin, if I just intervened, but we've had this on one, the, on one of the questions, actually. And I remember there was a, uh, you know, there was a professor uh, who answered, I forgot what her name was, but she said it's something that's very difficult to measure because, um, you know, it's an absolute value and you will never get the eagle pressing exactly like the way you want it and way but i'm just answering the question i don't know if you would agree with that but it's a it's a very difficult uh one to assess anyway yeah absolutely and all i can do is just give you know the anecdote where there was so much force as the eagle was passing over the the fox and snagging it that the fox swung completely around and almost landed on the back of the eagle uh, which you can actually see in that sequence. You know, this is a fox that's under the eagle, swings all the way behind it and all the way back over the top, you know, like a, like you know, like when we were kids on the swing set and trying to swing as much as we can and try to flip the thing all the way over. You know, there was so much force in this that the eagle almost did that with the fox. And you know, I wouldn't have any idea how to quantify it, but the fact that uh, that you know the fox had almost ended on the eagle's back was just incredible. Sorry, I forgot I muted my microphone. Let's just go to the next one. I'm going to show some of the sequences and please comment and then we'll uh, continue with uh, questions because it's very fascinating to have your comments. I really love this. Go. So here we go. So what we're looking at here is, um, so the whole purpose of my book, um, which is called Deer of the Eagle, actually began when I was doing some work at a bald eagle nest in Kirkwood, Washington, which is just east of Seattle. And um, I had arrived at the nest um, in 2001 in the summer, uh, just hoping to get some pictures of this bald eagle behavior, or that bald eagle behavior. Because a lot of what I do is um, have a vast library of different behaviors and different animals so that that way when somebody else is doing a book or a magazine article um, that I might have images that are relevant to them and so my images generally end up in somebody else's work not my own book and um, over the course of my time in the nest I actually just realized just how fascinating this whole process of learning to fly is and so that actually even became more important to me than even getting images and one of the stages in learning to fly, a lot of people think that uh, when it's time to learn to fly, the mama eagle just you know, kicks the, the young eagle out of the nest like it was a football, and then it just takes off on its magical flight, and that's the end of it. In reality, it's 
it's much more complicated. It's, it's um, more like, I think, how we learn to ride bicycles. Um, there's a lot of little baby steps, and trial and error, and you gradually take on bigger and bigger things until it builds up into um, that incredible first flight. And what we're watching here is something um, that is called flapping is the, is the actual term for it. And um, one of the things that the eagles do before they get ready to, to do something more ambitious is just to set in the middle of a nest and flap their wings as hard as they possibly can. And that gives them a little bit, of, it does a couple of things. One of the things it does is it sheds a lot of those um, down feathers that they were born with that just aren't uh, light feathers at all. Um, it helps them build the strength in their wings. And it also gives them a little bit of that sensation of lift because um, as you can see in this video, they actually end up a couple of feet above the nest once they're really going. Um, so after I had gotten some pictures of this, um, I wanted to get some video to, uh, just in case I ever wanted to do a multimedia thing. And um, it turns out this is actually a video that's really helpful that I do when I end up doing um, talks to different organizations or different groups to explain the process of how a bald eagle learns to fly. You know, Kevin, that is so interesting. I, I really like your analytical mind. Uh, it reminds me, uh, when I was uh, in on the Illusions, I did a video and I compared a juvenile catching a fish compared to an adult. And it is very similar. You know, it takes a long time for them to to um, understand the whole swing me mechanism, which is really complex. You know, use your arms as a rope and they... they, they uh, you know, you can see their whole body just swinging around and to get the timing exactly right, because the moment they touch the ground, uh, they, they are basically standing, right? And to get right. it right so that you can get the, the, the proper momentum forward is, uh, is very difficult. And uh, uh, juveniles just can't get that. You can see that, you know. So it reminds me a bit of that, too. I, f I find the same absolutely fascinating. So I agree with you. I just had to throw that in. Okay. No, I, that's, that's it. I, I want to learn more about that. Um, because it, it was one of the reasons that I love this project so much was that I just remember being in school and being told that everything was just instinct, instinct, instinct. That, you know, all these animals just, you know, are hatched or born knowing how to do all this stuff. But it's just the more time that I spend in nature and the more of these projects that I take on, I, I just find more evidence that they learn like we do. Um, and that uh, fascinates me to no end. Okay, now comes an interesting sequence here um, that many have probably you've seen this. So, say, uh, well, I've seen similar situations. That's what I want to say. So, just explain. It's a very short video, so I'm going to play it over and over again, and maybe you can comment on it, please. Thank you. So, this is actually one of the incidents that I had witnessed at the bald eagle nest that just convinced me that I needed to do a book on how eagles learn to fly. In the first year that I spent at this particular nest, and I ended up doing three summer seasons there, I, I had gone through three nesting seasons to try to see where the story was the same or where it was different or if I could, you know, come up with, with any common traits. Um, in the first year that I was at the nest, um, they had two young eagles. And what had fascinated me was that one of the young eagles was interested in flying, but the other one had no interest at all in flying. And I just, how could that be? Um, and so one of the young eagles was actually able to make really terrible initial flights to other trees, but the other eagle was still petrified in the nest. And even though the eagle, the young eagle that was flying could probably go 50 to 100 feet, um, it eventually became concerned that its sibling wasn't flying. And what I had witnessed, it, it looks to me like it had created some games in order to help its sibling um, develop an interest in flying and then also perfect its flying skills. And the first thing that I had witnessed was that even though the eagle, the young eagle that was flying could probably go 100 feet, it started only flying to the very next tree, um, which was only you know 20 feet away from the nest. And it would just holler and holler and holler, it would spend all morning crying over to its sibling. And finally, its sibling flew over and onto the same branch. It finally made its first flight. So they briefly touched wings 
And the eagle that was interested in flying then flew to the very next tree over. And they kind of repeated this process for like a couple of trees. And it just, it looked to me like they were playing a game of tag. And I thought, how incredible is this? Um, for a number of reasons. Um, and so eventually then this young eagle that had no interest in flying was actually able to do some flying, but it was still just terrible in terms of its, its precision and control. And so the eagle that you see on the left of your screen, that's the one that was kind of acting as a flight coach for its sibling, ended up breaking sticks off of trees, flying um, up above this park, uh, calling out to its sibling, and then dropping the stick once they were relatively close together. It seemed like they were almost trying to play this weird midair game of catch. And this is a behavior that actually went on for a couple of weeks and I never saw a successful passing of the of the stick, but uh, there was quite a pile of these these sticks that were in the field, and it was just to see e young eagles playing games to learn how to fly. Just told me that there was a great story here that really needed to be told, and I wanted to devote the resources to do it. Yeah, it's so interesting that you you know you're you're mentioning the interaction here of siblings and how they how they learn. The first I my first picture ever, and it reminds me of of, of a juvenile eagle was taking a, a cone high in the air and just dropping it and then catching it again. You know, for us that is a very difficult process. But that's all. It was all a game, you know. And uh, I I thought, what is he doing this for? And that's exactly the yeah. same. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's little things like that that I just I love. It's it's you know those those um, those little moments and thinking about the thought process that goes on behind it. Um, and again, for me, it's realizing that um, I think we often use instinct as a lazy way of um, as an excuse that we just don't know. Um, I think that you know the animal mind is is a complicated and and wonderful thing. And Kevin, that here comes a question. Dear Swisher, D Swisher, sorry, D Swisher says, at what age do the young begin flapping? And then I'll put uh, Patty D's, hi Patty, her question on how close to the nest were you when, when you did this flapping video? Uh, the flapping, oh, that's in the nest. Why? Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, so um, they begin flapping. Um, you can kind of see really weak elements of it at even about four weeks. Um, but, you know, at that point, they really don't have flight feathers. So they're still very awkward. Um, their head is almost bigger than um, the lower part of their body. And so you can almost kind of see them fall over a little bit. Um, the more serious flapping begins probably at about six weeks. Um, and the video was captured um, you know, probably 100 feet away. Um, this was a, a park um, that used to be a, a, a school. And they had torn the school down because um, it had long uh, past served its useful life but they left this giant dirt mound there for some reason um, and it looks really out of place in this park but it actually allowed me to kind of climb onto something and and shoot across to get a better view actually into the nest than I could have gotten from the ground so it was about a hundred feet back So and it looks like here we're uh, watching um, video uh, that I had shot. One of the other things that you often see at the nest site is these crows that just harass the bald eagles. Um, so both uh, bald eagle parents are very involved in, in raising their young. Right. Um, it's, it's the male that ends up doing a lot of the hunting, and he does a lot of that hunting from usually... Uh, you know, a distance that's not very far from the nest itself. So he's usually at the top of a neighboring tree while she is on the nest, you know, with the young ones. And as he's on this perch, about every hour and a half or so when I was out there, all these crows would just suddenly decide to mob him. And so I'd spent a lot of time getting great still images of it because it's just, it's the still images that um, is what I do. But then after I got the still images, I, I wanted some video just to show, um, just how relentless this process is. And I think one of the other things you can actually see from the video, which is harder to capture in the still uh, photographs, is that sometimes these crows actually hit the back of the eagle, as you, you just saw there. It was just, that's how close they get. Um, and these battles you know, were happening about every 90 minutes. 
um, the eagle would put up with this for about five minutes or so, and then finally they would end up driving it off. And, you know, the crows are never actually a threat to the bald eagle, but, you know, they're annoying enough to force him to go to a different hunting perch. And I did see on one occasion where uh, the bald eagle actually ended up coming back with a dead crow. So the eagle, at least once during my three-year project, actually got some revenge, but most of it is just for show and annoyance. Oh, sorry. That is so interesting again, Kevin, because I've spent a lot of time watching these scenes too. What, what, I, what I found is actually that uh, the reason why these crows in there, as you, as you already remarked, you've studied crows in, in detail, uh, act so intelligently as a group and they, and they do, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to one of the future shows is I'm going to uh, have a crow expert. I didn't know there was such a thing, but it's incredible. There's a, a crow expert on the East Coast who has studied crows for years and has done phenomenal, uh, you know, absolutely phenomenal what he, what he has observed. Uh, so, so I just wanted to uh, bring that in. But what, what I found interesting is I did also see, um, uh, as you correctly say, Papa coming in uh, and grabbing uh, the, the young. Of course, they're very, they're very vulnerable and they, you know, whoops, they take them right off. And of course, that um, results in a lot of aggravation and anger uh, of a whole community of, of, you know, siblings and uncles and whatever, uh, taking, taking it out on the eagle. That, that's exactly what, what happens. So very interesting interesting behavior but they seem to be used to it now you know? yes. it was quite a show but it was mostly for show <laughs> okay next question here we go let's see uh that is suzy q hi suzy that's uh, a wonderful moderator here who also helps i think this shows the importance of siblings how they teach each other so she's referring to your or uh, to your uh, video the earlier one of of the uh, juveniles uh, very nice remark and then Question number 19, Alatrax says, Tracy, yeah, uh, Tracy's her name, sorry. Kevin, did you have any schooling on photography? If not, how did you learn? I think you did answer part of it, but maybe you can say it again. And then also, how long did it take uh, uh, take you to, to get really a fairly good at this art? And then in brackets, she said, would love to know the same from me. Okay, but please, this is your show. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Kevin. So I, and I hate to admit this, but when I was growing up, I really had no interest in art. Um, I was, um, you know, I loved math um, and just, I just didn't think that art really had a place in my life. And, uh, you know, obviously I was wrong about that. Um, so when I, so I had no training because um, it's just, I wasn't interested in it. And it wasn't until I was starting to take photos of my hikes and I just realized just how how bad they were i mean it's not that they were terrible pictures but they just they just didn't communicate anything and i think that a really powerful photo um you know for it to be art it needs to communicate it it can't just be some some detached scene um so what i did was i went to a bookstore and um i you know there's a lot of how-to photography books the ones that mattered to me were the ones that really talked about composition and exposure. And one of the things that, um, that I learned was that there really is a visual language. Um, like we respond to things based on where they are on in the frame and how big they are and whether certain lines lead to them and whether there are opposing colors that are nearby or, um, you know, the, the relation of, sizes to different objects that are in the scene and whether or not there are other objects to the scene. And there are all these, these, um, you know, it's like words. Um, there are these visual building blocks that you can apply um, to help convey something in a still photograph. And so I was looking for books that really kind of got into compositional theory and then after I kind of exhausted those um, in the photography realm, I studied a lot of work of painters, um, you know, because they it's it's the same thing. It's the same visual language. It's just the, the tools that they use are different. Um, and so I've really found actually that for me, the work of the Impressionists um, is... Um, you know, the Impressionists are, are really, uh, I've learned a lot from their work and, and the way that the colors and, and the motion and the movement work. And it's just, it's, 
you know, for me, I, I don't know how else to describe it, but they're just, there are these visual building blocks that are like words. And once you kind of learn how to apply them, I think that's when you can actually make a really big difference with your art. But it's, it's really a matter of um, looking at compositional theory and, and, and composition and, and learning that language. Um, and it can be done. It, it took, uh, I mean, my photos were immediately improving after I'd done even rudimentary research into this. So it's not an insurmountable challenge. Um, the challenge is actually to continue growing um, over the course of your photography career or, you know, to, to, if you want to continue doing it as a hobbyist, you know, even to continue um, developing your work over time, um, because I think it's really easy to sort of fall into a rut where you're doing things that you know that work and you're not really really trying new things and so once you actually have some of those visual building blocks we understand a little bit of that visual language then I think it's really important just to try things and a lot of things are not going to work out right um, but what you should do from those things because this is what I do is I try to figure out why that didn't work you know what don't I like about it why isn't it um, what you know why isn't it resonating with me and then to, to, you know, to try to develop your, your ability to use the visual language, you know, from that. And it's, it's an ongoing process. And that's actually one of the reasons why I always switch from uh, uh, landscape to wildlife photography and back and forth, because even though they're different things, the visual language is the same. And, and it's just for me switching um, from those different types of photography helps me to continue to grow as an artist. That's a beautiful answer. I do have to jump in very quickly with a question of my own. Before we jump to your wonderful book, The Year of the Eagle, you talk about impressionists. I want to know who is your favorite impressionist. And just uh, go on with another question so I don't forget MacLady. I apologize. I overlooked her question. MacLady says, uh, asked just that was about the fox again. Was the fox actually wounded by the talons? Maybe. Uh, but let's first go to the impressionist and then jump back to that. And then we'll jump straight to your book. Okay, Go ahead, please, Kevin. So I think Van Gogh and Monet are probably the two that I've learned the most from. And it's just it, it's just the movement in those paintings, um, you know, because when you think about it, photography is capturing one one brief moment of time. But you're really trying to tell a story with that. You know, that story isn't just that one split second. There's a, a story of what happened to lead up to that second and, and what will happen next. And so just the way that they use movement and the way that they sort of imply uh, movement and motion with the way that they use colors and the brush strokes, um, just the, they have been, um, their work has been really interesting to me. In terms of landscape painting, um, the Hudson River uh, School painters, um, you know, uh, Thomas Moran is incredibly inspirational to me, just the way that he uses light. Um, so, uh, I, I find myself often trying to use, uh, you know, trying any time that I'm given anything that could possibly be considered even the slightest bit dramatic weather wise, I try to find ways to incorporate that just because I've seen how he has used that light and weather, um, to make scenes more dramatic. Um, and, uh, Albert Bierstadt uh, is also one of those painters, you know, in that school who, um, does similar work and I found a lot of inspiration uh, there as well. Very good. And finally, the question from Mac Lady was the fox wounded by the talons? So I don't forget. I don't think he was. And it's hard to believe because as I look back on the images, what it looks like is when the, the eagle was grabbing the rabbit, it looked like one of the talons kind of got the scruff of the fox's neck. Um, but I had spent about um, 20 minutes to a half hour with that fox after the incident, and I didn't even find a trace of blood. So I don't know how that happened, but um, the fox looked fine. It was running fine as it went back to its den, kind of sheepishly, but um, um, it looked like it was certainly stunned, but I just didn't find any long-term damage. And um, there was kind of a distinctive trait with his ear even before this had happened. And so other people who had gone to that park for a couple of weeks afterwards were able to actually see him. And they say that he looked fine as well. Well, that's a, that's a wonderful outcome. Okay. Okay, let's jump to your book. Please comment a bit about The Year of the Eagle. It's a wonderful title. Tell us a little bit about it. Thank you. 
Thanks. So this started with my three summers observing the bald eagle nest. And so I had captured a lot of images about them learning to fly. And I wanted to tell the story of the sibling helping the other sibling. Um, but, you know, this is just one part of the story of the bald eagle. Um, here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, our bald eagles are actually relatively unique in the sense that they don't migrate. In most of the rest of the country, bald eagles are actually migratory birds. Um, in fact, um, you know, the, the young bald eagles that are, are uh, tracked in, uh, th there's a, a bald eagle nest in Oklahoma where the birds are actually uh, electronically monitored after they leave. And they've actually found that you know, a bald eagle there within just a couple of weeks after leaving the nest can actually end up fairly far north into Canada to feed on fish, can end up you know, thousands of miles away. Well, our bald eagles may migrate a few hundred miles over the course of the year, just going from, you know, the lakes and the rivers around the Puget Sound area near to, near Seattle up into the mountains when the the salmon run, um, you know, is, is at its peak or out, you know, toward the Olympic Mountains at Hood Canal in the summer if they aren't nesting in order to feed on some migrating fish there. So for us in the greater Puget Sound area, we have eagles all year round, but depending on the season, their story is very different, uh, where they get the food, what they're doing. And so the whole book, um, while it started with the idea of just showing how eagles learn how to fly, turned into following these resident eagles around over the course of the year to uh, illustrate and talk about the different things that go on in their lives and just kind of capture a year in their lives. Very, very nice. And when did you actually publish this? The first version of this was, um, it, it what, it, the first version of this came out on the at the end of my third year at the NASA so in 2013, and um, it became I I got to do a lot of uh, presentations to various groups about um, bald eagles and how they learn to fly and and so the book has actually been out of print for about th uh, two two I think it's been out of print for about two years now and I just haven't had any copies and people have asked for it um, so I'm going to be doing a, a a bald eagle presentation at the Puget Sound Bird Fest next Friday in Edmonds, Washington. Um, so wanted to have the the book back in stock for that just because it is such a huge event here in the greater Seattle area. But also with the eagle capturing, um, you know, the rabbit from the fox, I, you know, there there's a lot of interest in that image. That image is a part of the eagle story here. And so I wanted to create a new version that's that's able to um, to get that storyline in the full book. And so the book is actually going to be back in stock in about a week um, for the first time in a couple of years. And I'm very excited about it. So it's expanded with some new images, um, the new images of them and their wintering grounds. And I've updated the text a bit. So I'm very excited that that this is coming back. Well, I spot one new new image there. I think everybody else yeah. too. <laughs> so it had to go on the cover. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I'm going to just bring up uh, another image. Then we're going to show. Uh, let me just bring this one up. There we go. So uh, before we go to the quiz, because my goodness, we're talking for quite some time. Um, and Kevin must get a little bit tired. I'm going to give two final questions to Kevin. And this is, by the way, a beautiful image that Kevin has kindly donated to the three winners, which we will see who they are, because we're going to play the same thing, the quiz show again. Then you can call in and answer a question that will come, or three questions in this case, that Kevin will pose. So enjoy this beautiful eagle. I'm going to expand it a little bit sitting out in the sunrise or sunset, I'm not quite sure, but the colors are absolutely beautiful. So thank you, Kevin, for doing that. So let me just get to the final question. That's Sherry McKevin asking, do you set up blinds to hide yourself behind when you wait for something to happen? Oh, that is a great question. Um, and I love this. I don't. Um, in fact, oftentimes I will talk to the animals I'm photographing. I mean, they know I'm there. Um, and I just think there is nothing more creepy to an animal than trying to hide and sneak around um, because they know you're there. And it's just, I think that behavior would be more alarming to them than some guy just standing out there and, you know, talking to them. Um, so no, I don't use any camouflage on my equipment. I don't hide in blinds. Um, 
I mean, they know I'm there. They know I'm not a threat. I try to get them. I try to earn their trust and be welcomed into their world. And um, sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, if I'm I'm in a place and it looks like they're not comfortable with me, I pack up and I I move on. No picture is is worth um, harming them or causing them undue distress. But I've just found that most of the time, being myself, not being a threat, and um, has been enough to actually just be welcomed into their world and to be able to capture what I've been able to capture. Very nicely said. Final question here, number 21. Proud cat mama of two, Kevin. Do you have any tips or advice for a person who wants to begin with photography or photo photograph wildlife? Some tips, please. So I think pick a topic that you're interested in. Um, because one of the best ways to grow as a photographer is actually to shoot the same subject over time. Um, you know, I, the example that I often use is that there are a lot of photographers who will go to a national park on a vacation. And, you know, the first time you go there, just like there, you find pictures everywhere. And it's only after you grow as a photographer that you find that you were just taking these sort of knee jerk reaction sort of snapshots that you were, they're basically just snapshots. And it's only after uh, spending some time with the subject that you actually then find um, ways to make the subject your own, to provide your own unique take on it, your own unique stamp. Um, and that just takes time. And it's not a, an easy process and it's not a fast process. I mean, I think about the pictures that I took of the very first time that I went to Yosemite. They just aren't as creative as the pictures that I took um, five months ago in Yosemite. Um, it's just because I, it's an area that I photographed a lot. And so when I see something, um, you know, oftentimes I realize, oh, I've, I've already done that. I need to actually think a little bit harder and try to figure out what it is that I'm really responding to and what it is that I really want to communicate and what I want other people to see. And it's that process that I think really opens your eyes as a photographer and helps you create some unique images. And I just don't think that you can generally do that on the very first time that you've ever set out someplace. So you're just, you know, the, your first time, you're just so overwhelmed with just uh, capturing the snapshots that I just don't think that there's, there's that level of creativity. Um, as you grow as an artist over time, you learn how to do that in the field. So if I, I go to a brand new place, you know, I can still work through it mentally and try to create some new images. But when you're trying to um, establish yourself as an artist and grow as a photographer, I find just working one subject um, and trying to do a, a body of work, try to create 10 images on, on one subject that you really care about. And just that process of trying to create uh, a body of work or a series will help you actually grow as an artist and let you actually learn how to see. Um, so that that way you're actually capturing some creative images and not just merely doing knee jerk um, snapshots to uh, the scenery or the wildlife that you're presented with. Yes. And I would add, and you have to have the fire and the passion. That's really important. <laughs> oh, I, have <laughs> <laughs> I think you described it very well. Work. No, it's not easy. Absolutely. But uh, very rewarding. Wonderful really to have you here, Kevin. So let's, let's go to the final part, the exciting part. I'm going to blend in a number here. And uh, so that is the dial-in number. I hope this is all going to work now. I'm going to just uh, put up my loudspeaker and hope that there won't be any echoes or so. So please, um, Kevin, your turn to come up with question number one, uh, something that you can think of. Uh, yeah, and let's see who, um, who will answer. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Um, well, so I guess question number one, what is the name of my book? Okay. Oh, that is so easy. Oh, my goodness. You lucky people. You got to get a picture for nothing. Go ahead. Dial in. <laughs> oh, he's too nice, Kevin. He's too nice. Okay. So you can take your chance and 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 dial in and you know you might as well but please make it difficult now a lot more, more, more difficult okay. question number two because we often have uh two or three people following in so we might as well pop out with a second question go ahead <laughs> so how long did the battle between the eagle and the fox and the rabbit last yes and kevin alluded to that very clearly so if you have listened uh, you should know the answer, and if not, you need to spool back and find out. So that's it. 
how many hours was it? I'm only joking, so. <laughs> <Come on>. <laughs> 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 All right, that's right. Okay, so that's question number two. So you heard that. How long did that battle take between the between the eagle and the fox? And one more, and then we have them all, just in case people phone. I hope they do. Um, uh, what island did that incident happen on? Oh yes, that's. I mean, um, ho hopefully you listened. It's not. It's uh, that's right. So we have these three questions. What island did that incident happen on? So there you go. Three questions i think that are fairly easy to answer i think kevin's really nice so go ahead <laughs> we're gonna wait now <laughs> and, and just uh, just let you yeah let's see if there um um how can people oh here we go let's see now let's hope that this time i get this correct one second i better get this correct hang on one second let me just do this and just minimize this i don't know hello oh wait hello Hang on, I'm just going to put the put you on the full screen here because I I can't deal with everything at the same time. Let me try this again. Hello? Oh, I don't know why this always happens. It's like, come on, answer. Hello? Hello. Hello, who is this, please? This is... Alicat Tracy. Alicat Tracy, yes, you've answered, you've, you've given some beautiful input to this. Very nice to have you on the show. Where are you calling from? Uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, wow, Birmingham, Alabama. You don't sound like this accent that I always have when people are from Birmingham, Alabama, because I can never understand them. So I can understand you. That's good. <laughs> very nice. Is it very warm there now? Very warm, yeah. Very warm and humid, I guess, right? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. And, quite, and very humid, is that right? Is it very humid there? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Well, anyway, uh, uh, so here is your chance to answer the first question. So what is Kevin's book called? That is your question. That's question number oh, one. Oh, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. <laughs> Year of the Eagle. The Year of the Eagle, you got it right. Isn't he nice to, to make it so easy? <laughs> He's laughing. That was nice. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, well, thank you so much for calling in from Birmingham, Alabama. I hope it's going to cool down a bit for you. And, um, well, thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so that was the first question answered. The second one, let me just... Yes, how... Okay, here we go. Here we go. Next question. I'm not sure why my mouse never clicks. Hello? Hello? Hello, with whom am I speaking, please? Sherry M. Ah, Sherry M, we know you very well. Thank you for participating so nicely on the show. So the question, uh, so where are you calling from? Edmonton, Alberta now. Edmonton, Alberta, you are my neighbor. That's very good. <laughs> uh, just before you dive into the, the complete cold again, which we fortunately don't have in Vancouver, we're a bit lucky like Seattle weather. It's a bit, it's just horribly rainy, but we don't have your horrible cold <laughs> in winter. Yeah. But anyway, so question number two was from Kevin. So question number one has been answered. Question number two is, how long did the battle between the fox and the eagle last. Kevin did mention it. Do you remember? I think he said it was about eight seconds. You go bang on it's eight seconds. He's nodding. Absolutely. You oh. paid attention. Very there good. Go. Yes, she said, way to go. Very good. Kevin smiling all over his face. So thank you for answering that and thank you for being there. So that's going to be uh, one uh, for you. I don't actually, I, I just thought I don't have to spin my wheel today because it's always the same picture that's going to come up. So <laughs> it's this picture. So I just thought, oh, I have a prepared that. So very nice that you've been on the show. So you are a lucky winner. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Okay. One more caller, please. One more caller for the final question. And that was where the island, the name of the island where this battle took 
place where Kevin loves to go? That's the final question. Come on, please. Uh, let's have one more caller, and then we are. Uh, then then we've done that. So last caller, please. We'll wait. Yeah, quite incredible. Yeah, Kevin, I'm I'm just curious. Have you? Um, let's let's talk a little bit until the next uh, uh you know you you said you filmed crows and so on have you ever done hummingbirds or something i'm just curious i love hummingbirds so i'm just asking <laughs> yeah so i've planted flowering currants oh yeah so but i would love to get a hummingbird nest that would also would be very high on my list I agree. I don't know why it's so difficult because they're everywhere and I have exactly the same problem. Where are their nests? <laughs> you know, I have looked in our whole neighborhood. It's so difficult. It's so difficult to find them. Yes. Yes. I think that's it's across the street from me, but it's about 20 feet up. I see it flying in there and, and hiding, but um, it's, it's eluded me. Yeah. Do, do, um, so I guess... Uh, well, we've had lots of hummingbirds this season. You know, I have a feeder in the front and in the back of the house, and uh, my goodness, they they drink like crazy. So <laughs> good. So, is there one more person, please, calling in for the last question, the final question? Where on which island was this taken? By we've actually uh, spoken about this island before about eagles and so on that's what i can say it was uh, actually appeared on one of the um, islands but i won't give more hints than that but um, that's actually also quite easy so please dial dial in and give us give a there's a final one for the picture okay so you can dial in let me just put the picture up again so they can look at it quickly let's see here we go uh, no, here we go, and there we go, there we go, that's it, yeah, there we go. There's there's the picture, okay, so let's just, um, let's just wait until the final caller comes. And if there is no final caller, well, then we have two winners. Is there nobody else? <laughs> They're all gone off, off the weekend. Not sure, or nobody dares phone. I know, I saw that Osprey Mama doesn't want to call in because she said she's won too many times. <laughs> so... <laughs> I guess there are some who are very respectfully holding back, but I really mean now for the third one, just call in. Anybody can call in. So if you if you feel like it, call in. That's uh, that's very nice. Oh yeah, Kevin, just uh, let me ask you something. You you were talking about some dream equipment that you would love to afford. What are you talking about? <laughs> Uh, the brand new version of that 600 millimeter lens. Oh, it's nice. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, you can always tell who's a professional because they have the really old equipment because that's what they're able to afford. <laughs> I have the first version of it. There is, so this is now two generations newer than what I have. Yeah, and yeah. aren't they, they? The new one is wonderful, isn't it? It's a lot light, lighter, the glass. Oh, here we go. Just give me, hang on. I'm just going to put your picture on this. Pull out this again. Let me just uh, try and answer this one. Hello? Hello? Oh, call ended. That was... Oh, what was that? That was... Uh, let's try again. Hello? Let's try again. Hello? It always seems to be difficult to answer phone. Hello? Hello? Oh, hello. With whom am I speaking, please? This is Proud Cat Mama of Two. Oh, Proud Cat Mama of Two. Very nice to have you. Where are you calling from? Upstate New York. Wow, upstate New York. It must be dark there now. Gee. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Oh, dear. East Coast. Very nice. Well, thank you for calling. What are the temperatures like now? Uh, starting tonight. Wow, good, very nice. But I guess summer's over there uh, soon too, isn't uh, it? Almost. <laughs> almost, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you live in Florida, so I guess you have eternal summer. But uh, so the third question was, let's get to it, was on which island did this battle between the fox and the eagle take place? Was it in the San Juan Islands? Yes, 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 it was. Well done. Kevin's nodding happily. So you are the third 
proud winner of the picture. So thank you so much for calling in and thank you so much for always participating. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, no problem. And thank you, Kevin and Dr. Sass. <laughs> Kevin's smiling. Thank you so much. Take care and have a All wonderful right. weekend. Thank you. Fine. You Bye. too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, that is great. So here is... Oh, well, we can't take any more... Uh, now I'm not going to take any more calls. So we just have to stop the calls now because um, we can't take that anymore. I'm going to try and close it down if I can. Or just, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna, sh gonna put this on mute. That's the best thing. Okay, now you don't have to hear it. Okay, so anyway, thank you very much, uh, everybody. I'm just gonna show the picture once again. Let's see if we can get it in here. Here's Kevin, I'll get the number away. So that's a beautiful picture. Can you just say, um, to tell us something about this beautiful image? So that is a picture from uh, near the bald eagle nest that I had uh, spent three years at for the Year of the Eagle project. And that is the male uh, who was out hunting at the very first light of day in order to be able to bring enough fish in um, for the, his two young um, eagles on the nest. He would go out at the very first light of day and look out into Lake Washington looking for food. And um, so he was able to capture him just as the sun was starting to climb over the horizon. Very nice. And actually, someone is asking here, how can people purchase this photograph? So so there are some people who want to purchase it. Now it's, um, Kevin, over to you. Yep. Uh, my website is livingwilderness.com. So just uh, send me a note there. Yes, and we have, uh, Kevin, we've put it below the show. Uh, uh, my my uh, wonderful moderators have done that. So livingwilderness.com is, uh, so if you want to see the link, it's just uh, below the YouTube and I think probably on Facebook, some moderators put it in. So uh, you, you can purchase these beautiful photographs and others from Kevin there. Thank you. Well, very nice, Kevin. So I'm just going to show myself also quickly. Let's see how we can do this. At least on the other side, yeah. Well, I have to go. go. <laughs> so we're both sitting on each side of the eagle, which is very nice. We're sitting more or less in the tree here, and you're flying above there. So uh, anyway, Kevin, I, I wanted to thank you for being on the show. It's been absolutely wonderful, really, uh, having you here. Thanks for taking the time. It's so nice to share this uh, this passion with you, and I, I so much understand from my heart how you, uh, you know, how you feel and and why you're so successful. It's really wonderful. So, thank thank you. you so much. This has been incredibly fun. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. So I'll talk to you in a moment. I'm just uh, so I'll, I'll um, just give the ends to, of the show and um, just stay on the line, and I will be there in uh, you know in just a moment. So thank you, Kevin. Okay. Well, let me just one second. Uh, Kevin is there. Okay. There we go. So uh, so that was a, a wonderful show. I just wanted to bring in the background here. Let me just make myself smaller again. Yeah, so I would like to, um, again, thank my wonderful helpers, Sasha, Susie, Kevin, and Jenny. This time it's getting much more stressful. They've, we've been uh, live on two channels. The third one, Periscope, didn't work. I do know, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tech geek, so I, I realized why it wasn't working. So next time we'll correct it. It's no big deal. So we'll be live next time on three channels, but we've been live on YouTube and Facebook, which is a big success, really been wonderful. So thanks for all the help. Uh, taking care of all the chats. I hope that we were able to uh, attend to most of your questions. So don't feel frustrated if uh, if we haven't answered something. We are trying to include you as much as possible in, in everything we do. Finally, I did want to say that for those uh, wonderful supporters of you who've been supporting me uh, throughout, uh, I'm going to have a special behind the scenes show tomorrow. Uh, that's uh, going to be on Patreon and I'm going to still email it to some of you. Uh, you're going to see some incredible equipment that's I'm going to Australia at the end of September again and going to take some wonderful astronomy pictures. That's something. So Kevin does his wildlife. I do my astronomy. We all have, you know, multiple, <laughs> multiple outlets. So I will show you some incredible equipment that I'm taking along there on my trip to Australia, which is really exciting. And then finally, uh, on Sunday as a big thing, you probably remember the Croydon nest, the Croydon nest. That was the horrible task where they took down this eagle nest, right? Um, there's a big, thing going on. I'm going to broadcast that on three channels uh, out from the field. I hope it'll work. But please be present at 2 p.m. I will announce it at 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern time. It's a big thing. David Hancock has gone to the initiative. This was where they cut down 
the Eagle Nest. The press will be there and it's going to be uh, uh, also a celebration of the implementation of uh, enforcing the Wildlife Act that you can't do such things and you have to have replacement for Eagle. So it's going to be a very interesting show at 2 p.m. So a very busy weekend coming ahead for me. Uh, next weekend at, uh, I will not be there because I'm, it's family time. I need to devote some time for the family. So we're going to actually have a long weekend and we're going to go out to Galliano Island. You've probably heard of Galliano Island, one of these beautiful islands. I will take my equipment along. So if I find something nice, I will uh, show that to you on one of the future shows. So thank you very much for being there. And I'll be back live again in two weeks uh, with the next uh, uh, show. Uh, so again, tomorrow I'll be live for the Patreon and some, uh, some very kind people who have constantly donated. And on Sunday, I will be there with uh, out on the field. We'll be watching David Hancock. So thank you for so much for being on the show. So I better get this right now because technology has become inherently complex. So let me just see how I switch myself off here. So I'm going to smile and say, <laughs> Kevin's smiling in the background, I can see him. So, okay, I'm going to say goodbye to my YouTube uh, listeners first. So we'll switch off there. Let's see if I can manage this. Oh, there we go.